Dear Ricky, that's what they called me when I was 10, okay? Fasten your seatbelt, and you're gonna have life experience that somebody who loves the sport of basketball can only imagine. And I'll leave you with this, Ricky. There could even be a trip to Springfield down the line. Springfield, trust me. I had a great relationship with my father built around going to sporting events. So I think from the time I was three years old, I was probably going to University of Washington football games, and uh, that's what we did. Rick Welts grew up in Seattle with his mother Phyllis, father Frederick, and younger sister Nancy. My dad, he loved to play, and my mom was a really, really hard worker. And I kind of thought about it, both Rick and I worked at sports. So it was a melding of the two of them. Sports in our household was what we talked about at the dinner table. It's what we did on the weekends. So it was a very big part of growing up. Before there was Amazon or Starbucks or Microsoft, there was the Sonics. My dad and I spent a lot of nights at the Seattle Center Coliseum watching the likes of Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain. That was the hook that set me on a path to have a career in sports. Rick attended Queen Anne High School and had a classmate who, little did he know, would change his life forever. This kid, Earl Woodson, he was the coolest kid at Queen Anne because he was a ball kid for the Seattle Sonics. One day he came in and said, my family's gonna move out of town. And I tried to pretend like I was really upset before I asked him, like, so Earl, like, could you take me down and introduce me to whoever it is that hires those ball boys? And I got hired to be able to be in the same room with my heroes and be up close and personal in a way that I never even imagined I'd ever get a chance to do. My first day working for the Sonics, I met three of my heroes. I met Lenny Wilkins, Rod Thorne, and I met Tom Sherry. I was traded here as a player, so, you know, my uh, first year here, Rick was a uh, ball boy. Yeah, he was a ball boy. And, uh, very intense about being a ball boy. Bill's a very early riser, so I was at work early one morning. He's like, uh, uh, white boy down the hall. So I was white boy down the hall, but we struck an uncanny friendship that lasted through my whole life that I, that I really treasure. He did a good job for me, and so I tried to bring him in as more part of the organization than just a ball boy. Yeah, he was a ball boy, then he became an athletic trainer. In today's NBA, I would say that probably takes four graduate degrees. Then it meant I knew how to use both the washing machine and the dryer. And then from there to go into the front office, I was very happy about it because he certainly deserved it. At just 24 years old, Rick became the Supersonics Director of Public Relations. It's my brother and I, we did all the stats by calculator, we typed everything up, we Xeroxed it. I mean, it was very kind of primitive. A week after the Sonics won their NBA championship in 79, I, I'd actually decided I would leave the team. And so Rick made an improbable move when he got a call from the NBA League offices in New York. I got on a plane, I got to spend a night in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. I walked over to the Olympic Tower, sat down with this young lawyer who was David Stern. I fit all the criteria. I was passionate about the NBA, I was young and I was cheap. So I ended up working all kinds of different capacities, getting to go on this amazing ride that the NBA went on in the 80s and the 90s. Gets it, feeds to Kemp, into the air, double pump. Why, caramba! The NBA of the late 80s and the early 90s was an incredibly dynamic place. David Stern was an ambitious commissioner. The beauty is David surrounded himself with incredibly talented people to bring these ideas into being, and Rick was one of those key people. We were a good team. He was all up 
and I was a downer. I used to make fun of him and his enthusiasm. Rick worked tirelessly with Stern to make a lasting impact on the NBA, starting with the creation of All-Star Weekend. Took it to Stern and said, I got an idea. Why don't we do a second day of events at All-Star? And he liked the idea. So with that, we set out to try to create what was All-Star Saturday. Rick had his hands in everything. That's part of Rick's story, is that so much of what we take for granted in the basketball world today has Rick's fingerprints on it. Rick was also the brains behind the marketing of the original Dream Team and a key component in the launching of the WNBA. The NBA really took a chance on women's basketball. To do something great for women just speaks volumes about who he is as a person. Nothing but net from Jen Azy. Rick understood how basketball could move people. And we grew and grew, and Rick was a part of every aspect of that growth. In 1991, Magic Johnson announced he was diagnosed with HIV. I will have to retire from the Lakers. We worked together to change the debate in, in the world on AIDS. Rick was a very private person. We never discussed the subject personally. My partner died of AIDS in New York City uh, in 1994. I don't even know how to put in words what it's like when you get that news that the person you love is uh, HIV positive. And to know that you are gonna have to watch and witness the person that you loved in your life die is something that nobody ever really could be prepared for. I had to go through that completely by myself. Nobody in the office knew I was gay. Nobody knew I had a partner. Um, I had to go through that whole experience without talking to anybody in the office. It's too bad because I think that his NBA family would have embraced him. But again, he just wasn't comfortable. After Arnie's death, Rick set up a scholarship fund in Arnie's name that was listed in the Seattle Times. You never get over a loss. And I knew that. There was an envelope from Scarsdale, New York. And I opened it up and it was a check from David and Diane Stern for $10,000. How did he know that? Had no idea. So I went back into his office. The first day I was back in and we kind of did the guy thing, like we didn't really talk about anything. It was bizarre, actually, when you think about it what was spoken about, what wasn't. The first communication we had about Arnie was when he opened the envelope, and that was it. These are better times than they were then. After 17 years at the NBA League offices, Rick decided to take on a new venture. He became president and chief operating officer of the Phoenix Suns in 2002. I had seen Rick in Phoenix create an amazing culture. There was just a real spirit and a joy. To have a leader like Rick, who's the ultimate cultural person, is incredible for any group. So I feel really fortunate to, not only to have worked with him, but to know him as a person. I've, I've learned a lot from him. One thing that was impressive about the franchise was the business side. I mean, there was a, a real sort of connection between the people and the fans in, in Phoenix and the organization. So I think a lot of that's attributed to Rick and, and his work. I had had nine amazing years at the Suns, but I felt like I'd done everything that I could do. I'd met my partner, Todd Gage. At the time I met Todd, I was commuting back and forth between Los Angeles to my job in Phoenix. And the best way to do that is Burbank Airport, Southwest Airlines. And it was a time where Southwest still had the stairs that would roll up to the plane on the runway. It's very old school, which is fun because it's kind of a throwback to the 50s. I was in one of the early boarding groups and I walked up the stairs. And so here I am, I'm the lead flight attendant, so I greet everybody coming up the stairs. And then here comes this gentleman. Who was standing there with this amazing looking person named Todd Gage. You know, I know, so he's handsome and he kind of smiled at me, I smiled at him and then he walked by and then he stopped and looked back and I, we caught eyes and that was like, oh, he looked back at me, that's interesting. We didn't speak, but I sat down. So I started taking orders and I get to row 8, 8F, my very last 
passenger. It turned out I was in his section. And it's this gentleman that I noticed looked back at me. I think he did serve me a Diet Pepsi in the one hour ride to Phoenix from there. I tried to buy him a drink. He's like, no, no, no. Just, you know, we kind of made eye contact and that was that. that nothing else was said. So then when he was deplaning in Phoenix, I did what any red-blooded all-American boy would do in that case, and I took a napkin and wrote my name and phone number on it. And as I was leaving the plane, I handed it to him and said, you know, that's for you. And not knowing if I'd ever hear from him again, but obviously I did. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. In his pursuit to do the best job that he could for the league, he did give up a lot of his personal life. It wasn't hard for me, but I reached a point, my father had passed away, my mother had been diagnosed with cancer, and I just kind of reached a point where I felt like now is probably the right time. After living so many years closeted in the workplace, Rick made the decision to come out publicly. He began that journey by asking for his mother's blessing. So I went to my mother and said, how would you feel about this? Because if it would bother you, like, you know, no problem. I can handle it a different way. And she was very encouraging. And, you know, bless her heart. She said, you know, you do what you think you should do. With that, he hatched a plan to publicly announce that he was gay with the help of a friend and media executive, Dan Cloris. He just looked across the dinner table to me and said, Ricky, I think it's page A1 New York Times. That was my holy cow moment, right? That was like, okay, all right. That's not quite what I was envisioning, but if it could be that, and it could make a difference in some kid's life who's growing up, who like me didn't have anybody like them that they could see in a role that they could relate to, then it would be worth it. Rick connected with reporter Dan Berry and began to tell his story through the eyes of all those who impacted him throughout his career. Got on the airplane, flew up to Seattle, and went over to Mercer Island to Bill Russell's house. And I said, Bill, like, here's the deal. Like, I'm gay. I'm going to talk about this in the New York Times. Would you be willing to do what I know you hate doing, which is talking to the media about something like this? And he was like, yeah, 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 fine, fine. And that was it. Sometimes that's very difficult. And I'm as proud of Rick as I am of any of my kids. So he came in and he said, I'm going to announce that I'm coming out, and I said something profound like, big deal. I remember being incredibly moved by his bravery for one, but also at his relief. It was almost like a massive weight had been lifted off of his shoulders, and so because of that, I was very happy for him. I'd written a long email that I wanted to send before the story posted, so the last thing I did before I got on the plane was hit send, and knew that somewhere 40,000 feet over Kansas, my life would pretty significantly change. This segment is brought to you by PG&E, proud community partner of the Golden State Warriors. Today's a really special day to be here at Edgewood Center here in San Francisco. As part of our Making Hoops program, we're here in partnership with the Good Tidings Foundation and PG&E, refurbishing not only the basketball court, but the entire facility. This is an honor bestowed upon me by the Warriors and all these organizations to do something very meaningful and to be a little small part of it. Uh, I'm grateful to the Warriors organization and all of the other organizations that were a part of putting this together, so thank you. So the plane touched down at JFK. I reached for the BlackBerry, turned it on, and it just about exploded. It was filled with so many emails and messages. The next couple days was a media tour to a lot of different places in New York, from CNN to Time Magazine. It never slowed down. I just remember, you know, when it came out, it was, it was amazing. He was just so excited and, I think, relieved. And then we get to the hotel, and that was probably the craziest part, is turning on, like, ESPN and seeing my boyfriend, the next topic of conversation on ESPN, like, oh my God, Rick, you're the next topic of conversation. That was kind of a surreal moment. He wanted it to be significant. I don't think he saw it as a page one story above the fold, but he was hoping he could be that role model that he didn't have. I didn't think it was a big deal. I was wrong. For him as an executive in a very male, extremely male-dominated sports world, 
To have the confidence to speak up meant the world to me. He used this platform he had in the NBA to be a role model for others, to demonstrate to others that even in an industry like professional sports, that someone like Rick could talk openly about being a gay executive. I was expecting maybe a 90-10 split between people who would be supportive and people who might not have that, that response. It doesn't sound credible, but there was not one person who actually took the time to reach out to me that was anything but incredibly encouraging and supporting. The remarkable thing about that is of the thousands of emails or the people that wrote letters from friends, from business associates, maybe that could be expected. The ones that, that always mean the most to me were from, from parents or from kids who just felt like there was a story to tell now or a connection to be made with somebody who seemed much more like them than anybody they'd seen before. And, you know, to me, those were the most and continue to be the most gratifying and, and really kind of made it all make sense for me. After nine years with the Phoenix Suns, Rick decided to focus on his personal life with his partner, Todd Gage. He was a Northern California guy with two kids in Sacramento. And I really felt, you know, I'd sacrificed a lot in my life and now was the time that maybe I could devote more time to family than I'd ever been able to before. So Northern California was calling. And so I met these guys, Joe Lakeham and Peter Goober. We just literally called around and said, who is the best there is in the business? Who would it be? And we got basically three different names consistently. And Rick was one of those three names. When we asked David Stern about him, because he worked at the NBA, or Robert Sarver, when he worked at Phoenix, all spoke about him as an authentic individual, somebody who was transparent. And that was an incredible quality for leadership that we needed, because he had to build the organization. And that takes a special person. I knew he was going to succeed. I think they made a very good choice. I think that it amplifies how committed Joe Laco and Peter Guba are to success. Rick met with us and was, it was instantaneous and it was automatic, it was done. We had one meeting, I flew up to Joe's house and Peter joined us there and we probably spent three hours together at Joe's house and then we went to dinner afterward. And at the end of that dinner, they said, okay, if you, if you wanna do this, if you wanna be president of the Warriors, we're, we're ready to give you that opportunity. Today, uh, Peter and I are really, really, really excited to be able to introduce Rick Welts as our new president and chief operating officer of the Golden State Warriors. He came with probably the highest recommendations from anybody you'd ask. Rick was actually a big reason for me coming to the Warriors in 2014. I knew how important melding the basketball side and the business side was. So coming to Golden State, I knew we could do that really smoothly since Rick and I were already good friends and so familiar with one another. It's been fun to watch him and watch his success because I know who he is as a person. Rick is kind. People want to work for him. They want to follow him because he cares. I don't really feel like he's a boss necessarily. He feels like a friend. He treats me like a friend and a business partner, not an assistant, which I think is rare, again, in business and especially in sports. It's just been great to watch what he's accomplished on his side and how he's really enjoyed the journey. I mean, he's had such a long journey in the NBA and to see it kind of come to fruition with our team in the last few years, I'm very, very happy for him. If anybody deserves success uh, at the highest level, it's Rick. I couldn't have made this up. It was, it's like it really couldn't have happened. That all those things would combine at the same time and my incredible good fortune that they did and that continues till today. It's allowed me to have an amazing life. It's allowed us to be part of three and counting championships and really the thing that I'll be thankful every day that Joe and Peter gave me that opportunity. Ah, uh, legacies for others to write. Rick is generous, loving. Respected. And a person that cared about more than himself. He's just such a classy, smart, kind person, and he exudes that. He understands implicitly the power of sports to affect social change. He inspired people. I think it continues to do that, so if that's his legacy, to be true to who you are, I mean, that's probably the best thing you could ever say. Rick changed the game. He truly did. And he's made his mark. He's put his heart and soul and his entire career into basketball. I'm excited that people are going to go through the Hall of Fame and not only see 
Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. They're gonna see Rick Wells. How cool is that? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Wells. Dear Ricky, that's what they call me when I was 10, okay? <laughs> Seattle's first major league franchise will be the NBA Supersonics in 1967. You will be so excited. You'll fall in love with the game. But even more importantly, you'll come to understand the unique power that sports has to bring people together and to be a source of pride, inspiration, and conversation in communities everywhere. Fasten your seatbelt. The style of basketball born in Phoenix will reach new art form at Golden State. Three rings, maybe more, thanks to Stefan, Clay, Draymond, Katie, Andre, and many others. Basketball will be your life. The game will give you gifts beyond what you can imagine and more than you can ever give back. But try. Do all you can do to give the game a bigger stage and brighter lights so others can see the beauty that you discovered so long ago. Be thankful for the life that will allow you to lead and the people you'll meet along the way. And I'll leave you with this, Ricky. There could even be a trip to Springfield down the line. Springfield, trust me. I knew exactly this is the way it would work out. Are you kidding me? Like, are you serious? <laughs> I thought if I could ever be the PR director of the Sonics, that would be like the ultimate achievement of my life. So, uh, yeah, no, this was not uh, this was not the script. <laughs> <laughs>